Thank you, Byron. And uh, thank you for leading such good worship. That's a great song we just sang. Uh, that's on the screen. It says Pastor Emeritus, which means we don't know what you do or <laughs> if you're alive. That's right. Nice to be here. Thank you. And, and do keep the church in your prayers. It's a rebuilding time, as you know, and I don't mean that physically buildings, but life, and uh, stay faithful. Thanks for those of you that are staying in groups and giving and, and praying every day, and God will continue to help and uh, to rebuild, I'm sure of that. And I'm glad to have a connection from a bit of a distance. Janine and I came here in 1983, and uh, that's when I started dyeing my hair, and, <laughs> and I have to decide soon whether to sue over how I've aged, but I used to show, show my grandkids all the time, and I thought I'd show 83, because we've been connected that long, and actually it was my favorite church before then, second favorite, I pastored in Ashland, not far from here. And now I'm glad to coach churches. I do that in Michigan, not far from Notre Dame, who will beat Ohio State this Saturday. <laughs> you pay attention. I don't want any booing in this sermon. <laughs> Actually, I have a bet with a former pastor here who's up in Huron, and I don't usually gamble, but this is a bet. I, if Notre Dame loses, I have to give him Lake Michigan. And if, if Ohio State loses, he has to give me Lake Erie plus his house and his car and his church building because Lake Erie is not very deep. And so that's the goal. So thanks for your prayers for Notre Dame during this special time. Well, why do I have soap bubbles on there? Because seven years ago, I preached a sermon called Soap Bubbles. I'm sure you remember. It was in Ecclesiastes. I'm sure nobody remembers. I'm just saying, I'm going to start there. Ecclesiastes is Solomon, the very wealthy man, and a very uh, rich in, in knowledge and in wisdom. He wrote some of the best stuff in the world in the Proverbs. And yet he said, soap bubbles of soap bubbles, as he looked at life, it's empty. My Hebrew prof in, in seminary said you should translate vanity of vanities as soap bubbles of soap bubbles. That it just, it's gone. And you look at things that are happening in the world, and not just COVID, not just Ukraine, not just Putin, but people getting away with murder. You look at the headlines and you see Ukraine and Taiwan and Akron, and you know there's pain everywhere. Soap bubbles. Uh, you try hard, some of you, have tried hard to obey Christ, and it doesn't work out in terms of your job or family. Solomon tried everything. It says in Ecclesiastes, the words of the teacher, son of David, uh, a king in Jerusalem, meaningless, that's what the second verse says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Uh, everything is meaningless. I won't stop the sermon there. That's that's the way life is under the sun. Solomon wrote about under the sun. Now with the Webb telescope, we're seeing way beyond the sun. Uh, 250 million light years away, they showed the color that was out there. I don't know why God did that. I think he said it with a word and it was, it was done. But I think it's to make us say there's something above the sun, you guys, do you believe this? There's God who has created all of this. And so Solomon's search was like, well, like Psalm 73. Does God know what's going on down here? Does he understand that our leaders uh, sometimes so disappoint us, Biden and Trump and everybody else, and, and it, it looks like it's meaningless? So that's my first point. <laughs> Thank you, Newt. That's good. Life is meaningless. <laughs> Under the sun. Solomon said toward the end of his book, right at the end, chapter 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And then he went above the sun 
So we're going to talk about that. In Revelation, join me there if you'd like to. There's pew Bibles, and I'll stay in Revelation 18 and 19. You guys, this is the end of time, and it's the hope that is called one time the blessed hope in Titus. And it's, it's what we look forward to, and we can't believe everything about everything turning out right now. It doesn't. Revelation 18, after this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. Here we go. He's going to pull the curtain open and show us how it's all going to end. Uh, I urge you to believe this, but listen, it's fantastic. Verse 2, with a mighty voice he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Babylon. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk, here it is, the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. This is Babylon, and it's showing that Babylon is about University of Akron, anybody there that could care less that there's a God. It's about Washington, D.C., anybody there that mocks God or lives his own life. Under the sun, that's a meaningless life. Take God's word for it. It's empty. And that we won't be satisfied until we have a connection in the spirit because we are spiritual beings made in the image of God. Babylon, maddening wine. If you've ever been drunk, you know how maddening that is and how out of control it is. Don't do it. But it's a world that's like that everywhere, it seems like. Read the headlines. So the hard part is Babylon. It's, well, what does it stand for? When I was brought up, before the Civil War, In preaching, people said Babylon was the Roman church. Others said it was a revived Roman empire. You know, the seven hills are mentioned in Revelation. Seven hills of Rome, maybe. I think it's something different. Uh, Some people think it's a rebuilt Iraq or Babylon. In the Old Testament, there was always ABC, Assyrians, Babylons, Chaldeans. Same thing, a little different mix, but they always were attacking Israel. And God. So Babylon stands for everybody against God, living life on their own. Is that you? If so, if you just live your own body and do your own thing with your body, you're part of this kind of Babylon. It's always clear in the Bible that it's the enemy of God. I think it's called, forgive me, the great whore. Hello, it's It's spiritual adultery. It's everybody that you accept as Savior other than Christ. It's living for self. Babylon is, I think, a stance for not just Hollywood, but for everything that goes against the nature of God and the truth of God. And and, and, then church people can live there or find their hope there. Some of the best Christians we ever met. Janine and I were two weeks in Ukraine, so I'm not an expert, but it was right after the Iron Curtain came down, and they were wonderful people. On the street, they all looked glum and sad. You weren't allowed to look happy. But in their homes, these Christians, the chapel adopted a church in Kiev, and uh, they sang hymns before they ate and afterwards, and they prayed before and afterwards, and they told jokes and laughed, and their hope was in Christ. And now some of them, I'm sure, are dead because of Babylon, an evil ruler, it looks like. Maddening wine is when you drink for yourself. It's not just taking God's name in vain as if he doesn't care but it's living for yourself as if he doesn't care. It's, it's writing stuff as thinking God can't read Facebook or saying things that you think God can't hear us all. So that's Babylon. That's the bad news. And that's where it starts in, in, in chapter 18 here. 
But look what happens. I, I want us to see what happens, this conclusion that Solomon referred to. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Chapter 18. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a home for demons. The first three verses, as I said, are the maddening Babylon. But now, verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins, watch this, are piled up to heaven. But God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she given, as she has given. Pay her double for what she has done. Hello. I coach pastors now, and I do thank God for the chapel, and I often quote how good you were as a church to us and, and strong things that we're regaining. But when I coach, I often talk about the church and what's there, and I often talk to people in our neighborhood especially who say, why, if God's God, why does, kids, why doesn't he judge the evildoers? Why doesn't he say something to people who mock him? And whenever somebody brings that up, I say, well, there are verses in the Bible that say God's going to, in a huge way, punish evil. And if you talk about this final stuff and even hell, sometimes people will say, well, why would God ever allow someone to go to hell? And I can say with kindness, but you just ask when he's going to punish sin. Why doesn't he do something? He will. And in the meantime, he wants us to believe and rest in the way he judged Christ. So Babylon the verdict from the judge is right here at the beginning, and it's look out. Reminders about Babylon. The Tower of Babel, oh, Genesis chapter 6. They tried to build their way. People do it today. Science does it. We, we will be our own God. Huh? We'd all sit here and say, oh, come on. You're going to build a tower that goes to the heaven? Oh, come on. But we could just as easily say to ourselves, oh, come on, you're going to run your own life and mock God with your life or your morality? You don't think God cares? The city itself, they were always fighting the Israelis. Again, Assyrians, Babylonians, Caldonians, they were all the same, but enemies of God. And I think the verse stands for anyone who turns against God today. It's you. It's people in Hollywood. It's me. If our hearts are just to live for ourselves, and Solomon would say, vanity, soap bubbles, you live for yourself. So now he starts pronouncing the judgment at the end of time. Verse 4. And I heard another voice come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins. He's going to pay her back double. Verse 8, therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine, she will be consumed by fire. Whoa, mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When God first time described himself, Exodus 34, read it this afternoon, he said, I am a loving God. I am full of mercy. When Jesus described himself, I am gentle and lowly in heart. He's the creator of the universe. But then God added in Exodus 34, but I must judge sin. Not one of us knows what it's like to be holy, holy, totally holy. He will judge sin. The great judgment took place on the cross. Do you believe this? That every one of your sins, to, to see how God judges sin, every one of my sins was nailed to the cross. Jesus died for our sins. That's the judgment that God had to do in His holiness. He cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And it's because your sins and mine were being judged. Don't ever say, I guess I'm being judged for my sins. Nonsense. The judgment for sin is separation from God. When you believe in Him, do you? When you trust Him as Savior, that counts for you. Hello, that's, that's the gift of God. But more than that, nobody goes to heaven with a zero. When you put your faith in Christ, the righteousness of Christ covers you. So when you stand in front of God, you say, I'm with Him. And that's your eternity. So that's judgment. The, the sky turns dark purple. The rocks roll. The quake of the earth was scaring to everybody. The, some people rose from the dead just to show this is a big event. But that's when our sins were judged. Some people don't accept that, so here's the judgment for their sins. Babylon. Look what happens. The judgment continues, and, and, and the point is, in, the, in 1 John it says, don't love the world. Don't love Babylon, the things in the world. Because everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not from the Father, it's from the world. Don't, don't let those thoughts stay with you this year at, at college. The wrong ones. Look at the next sentence that says, the world is passing away and also its lusts, but he that does the will of God abides forever. This is, this is when this happens finally. Do you believe this? Or do you think this is a fairy tale? Do you believe God created the heavens and the earth? He, he said it. If he says it, it is so. When he divided the Red Sea, he didn't call a committee of angels. He just said, let the Red Sea split and Israel goes free. And when he comes back, it will be with a shout, it says in 1 Thessalonians. And this is where it happens. So life is empty, yeah, but there's something we need to look at. Verse 9, when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they'll weep and mourn over her. Woe, woe, O oh great city, O oh Babylon. It's, it's, it's the end. Verse 11, in judgment, the merchants of the earth, verse 14, they will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished. Vanity of vanities. Verse 17, in one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Whoa! Every sea captain He's just naming that everyone, famous athletes, famous people of the world, church leaders, if they're into themselves and not Christ, are all a part of this. He's saying, John's saying, this is the end, you guys. And so it moves. The only way I can explain the judgment that is ahead, uh, one of the ways that I can explain it is, is that God's moving history, it's like a big ship, the planet Earth, people. And it's going to come into port at exactly His time. Tomorrow, a thousand years from now, don't set dates. The point is, He's going to make everything fair, and judgment will happen at His time. When the ship comes into the port, I like to think of it this way, he's, Christ the judge, the Savior who offered himself will go from room to room and every nation or every person in that room will give account of their lives. The issue is, is this you, to be in Christ, protected. Your sins already judged, hello, paid for. In Colossians it says, do you know this? The Ten Commandments was nailed to the cross. All our judgment was taken. But here's the judgment on those who try it on their own. He, he, he goes on to, uh, in the rest of chapter 8, to say how everyone is involved with this. But then the whole issue is, well, look at chapter 19. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are His judgments. The roar of celebration. Verse 3, and again they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her 
whoa, goes up forever and ever. Verse 4, 24 elders sing amen, hallelujah. A voice from the throne, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Verse 6, the picture is a wedding, our union. It says, I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters. Verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. Some of you are married. You know who you are. You should. Last week I, I spoke at one of the churches I coach and the assignment was Mark chapter 12. It's when Jesus says, there is no marriage in heaven. I don't know if you know that. I didn't ask him if, how many are glad. I, but there is none. Why? Because there's something bigger, something better. It is the marriage of Christ, the Creator, with all His church. We're often called the Bride of Christ. And here it is that the, the bridegroom, that's the picture, there's some parables about this, the bridegroom comes back to be with the church of all ages, all believers, Old and New Testament. Is it you? The point is, life under the sun, yeah, Soap bubbles. Don't put your fortunes in this world, your hope in your heart. The Savior is coming back, and this is the union with Him forever and ever and ever. In verse 11, it says, I saw heaven opened wide, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eye... He, He's going out of his way to help us believe this is eternal strength. All right, it, the picture in Revelation is a man on a white horse, a lord. If he said a, a tank or a jet in those days, nobody would get it. The point is he's here in victory. When I was little, uh, some of you remember, anybody here over 100 like I am? We, the Lone Ranger was popular, and whenever the Lone Ranger appeared, obviously it was on his white horse, and the William Tell Overture, da -dum, I'll sing it for you, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, dun -dun -dun. Well, that's about all I can do. <laughs> we played the Lone Ranger all the time. I was always Tonto. <laughs> Nothing against Indians, but my big brother was always the Lone Ranger, and I was Tonto. Here's Jesus appearing on the white horse, saying to us, here we go. Life is not empty when you connect above the sun. I urge you to believe that. His point is, is so clear. First Corinthians, when this perishable, here it is, perish kids means you're going to die. You're going to get old. You're going to go into the ground. But when this perishable puts on imperishable, this mortal will have put on, you'll live forever and ever. He says, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. That's what this is. And it's all about Christ. And you know, everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His death for our sins his resurrection for our justification. Do you believe that? Are you in Christ? Your judgment of sins he took, your righteousness, he covers you in his eyes with his righteousness. God sees us that way. Live that way. Because life is not soap bubbles. It is meaningful when we live in combination with Christ, his spirit. At the end of time, this happens. Death is swallowed up in victory, and he's saying to us, it's the end. Do you believe this? Do you, do you rest in the one person who can conquer all and who gives meaning to life now? 
because we're connected above the sun. And in a sense, this day in the world to come is, is instead the beginning. And we shall live and reign with him forever and ever and ever. In Psalm number two, God says something that seems sarcastic at first. It says that God laughs at the nations. You got to take it as the Hebrews would hear it, that God will be ultimate victor. The nations rage. Why do the nations rage and, and take his name and throw it in the gutter? Be careful how you say the name Jesus and God just because of reverence. But here it is at the end of time, he's saying to us, God will laugh in derision because this is, his, this is what he meant us to be. It's the beginning of eternal life. Jesus is at the center of this, the bridegroom. On a white horse, okay, don't go there in too long. It's just saying he's the victor. Jesus is, in Genesis, the seed of the woman. He says, the seed of this woman, Eve, will crush the snake, the devil. Huh? Eve goes to all these people and Ruth and, and through David's line, and, and then there's Mary, a gorgeous gift to be the mother of Jesus. The seed of the woman will crush the snake. When Jesus died on the cross, the Ten Commandments against me and you were nailed to the cross. Hello, that's salvation. And he rises from the dead to show that it worked and to give us our justification. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the sum of all the offerings they're cared for at Calvary. In Numbers, he's, he's the, the cross of a pipe with a snake on. If you look there in faith, you'll be healed. Huh? All through the Old Testament, there's this hidden theme. When Paul talked about the rock in the wilderness that gave them water every day for 40 years and 40 nights, Paul says rather nonchalantly, that rock is Jesus. Huh? It means he's the source of, of uh, our thirst quench. He's the water of life. When Jesus stood in front of the tabernacle on, in John chapter 8 and they poured water to symbolize the rock in the wilderness that gave them water, water every day from the rock, manna every day, just enough pizza, manna, it's a translation of the word pizza, <laughs> just enough for a day. We got strength for the day in Christ. You guys stay faithful every day. Because this is the end, and this is what I called, what I mentioned as the blessed hope. Um, I always tell the story, I know you've heard it because I've been here before, of a Sunday school teacher that said to the people, uh, kids in our class, what has a bushy tail and four legs and hops from branch to branch? And a little girl raised her hand. She said, well, it sounds an awful lot like a squirrel, but it must be Jesus, because everything at church is Jesus. <laughs> That's right. Everything at church goes back to the cross, to the virgin birth, to the gift of God through Jesus Christ. And at the end of time, it's all there too. And it says, he shall reign forever and ever and ever. The same choir and orchestra, I like to picture this, that sang at the, at the glorious resurrection of Jesus will sing again. He's back. He's back. Life is not empty. This was our hope. This was our joy. Is this your beginning? This is where otherwise it's empty. So, so Solomon said at the end of his book, and he would add today, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. To fear God and keep his commands. And today, because of the birth of Jesus, his command is believe in my son. Put your hope in Christ. 
and with him we shall reign forever and ever. And in that choir and orchestra, the, the slaves that were once in bondage will sing the lead parts. I think babies that were never able to be born to live in life will play the trumpets. I think we will all sing a part of this heavenly chorus just to say, He's Lord and He's back. Be sure that's where your hope is for this church and for our future. No lowly Jesus, meek and mild now. No gentle Jesus in a manger. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords who conquered death and now conquers Babylon. All emptiness is gone. And that is our hope. Jesus. What brings us this hope? It sounds like a politician sometimes. No. What brings us this joy? It sounds like money or riches sometimes. No, no. It is Jesus and our unity with him and our serving him forever and ever. And then on that day, let's pray. Thank you, God, for the hope. Your man Paul called it the blessed hope that changes our lives. God, for, for these people, for me and all of us, help us live above the sun. <laughs> Not like everything's down here. For these college students, help them have a year of abiding in Christ, getting there and, and, and staying there. For parents and grandparents and kids and singles, help us believe you as much as we believe in the resurrection or creation that it's magnificent. As you pray, thank God for his son, eternal Lord, finally acclaimed that someday. If you're not sure you're in Christ, connected by combination, by faith in Christ, ask God to help you do that today. Don't wait. Let one of us help. We hail the power of Jesus, your Son, our Savior and our friend, forever and ever. Amen. Someday these kind of words will be said in different ways and sung in different ways all around the world. All hail the power of Jesus' name. His name means God is our salvation. Let us hail him and thank him. Let's stand. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, Nordonia, and Medina, please go to our website at thechapel.life.